one o'clock having arrived, I'm going to call the March 24th, 2022 meeting of the House Taxes Committee to order under rules 10.01 and also direct audience and other folks watching these proceedings. If you want to get all the materials that we have as members and staff, uh, please go to the website, Minnesota House of Representatives, go then to committees and divisions, then to taxes committee. And on that home page on the right hand side, you'll find all of those materials. Uh, with that, Ms. Griska, would you please take the poll? Representative Marquardt. Marquardt present. Representative Marquardt present. Representative Liz Lagarde. Representative Liz Lagarde present. Representative Liz Lagarde present. Representative Davids. Davids present. Representative Davids present. Representative Gabaje. Present. Representative Agbaje present. Representative Carlson. Carlson present. Representative Carlson present. Representative Detmer. Detmer present. Representative Detmer present. Representative Garofalo. Garofalo present. Representative Garofalo present. Representative Gomez. Gomez present. Representative Gomez present. Representative Her. Her present. Representative Her present. Representative Hertos. Hertos present. Representative Hertas present. Representative Howard. Howard present. Representative Howard present. Representative McDonald. McDonald present. Representative McDonald present. Representative Miller. Representative Moran. Representative Mortensen. Present. Representative Morten Mortensen present. Representative Robbins. Present. Representative Robbins present. Representative Sandell. Sandell present. Representative Sandell present. Representative Schultz. Representative Stevenson. Representative Swazinski. Swazinski present. Representative Swazinski present. Representative Joachim. Present. Representative Joachim present. We do have a quorum. Thank you very much, Ms. Griska. Uh, with that, uh, approval of the March 23rd minutes. Representative McDonald, would you yes, like sir. to make that motion to approve the minutes? Yes, yes, Mr. Chair. I make the motion to approve the minutes as. Uh, uh, we will amended. Representative no, no, amended. Donald moves approval of the March 23, 2022 minutes. Any discussion, thoughts, changes? If not, I'm going to ask you to temporarily unmute yourselves uh, for the vote. All those in favor of approving those minutes, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The motion does prevail. Uh, the McDonald motion is approved, and the minutes of March 23rd, 2022 of the House's House Tax Committee are approved. Members, we have five bills today, all to be laid over. Uh, the first bill up is House File 2675. Representative Petitza Watoon. Before we do anything, I want to say all right. I, Representative Petitza Watoon, uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will have someone move House File 2675. So, so moved, Mr. Chair. Representative uh, Chair Joachim uh, moves House File 2675 for possible inclusion into the omnibus tax bill. Uh, there also is an A3 amendment. Uh, Chair Joachim, would you like to move the A3 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Representative yeah. Joachim moves the A3 amendment. Representative Katitsa Watoon, anything we need to know about the A3 amendment before we put it onto the bill? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, just. Putting it in the order in which you'd like to see the bill? Yes, thank you. All right, very good. So members, um, we're gonna take a vote on uh, Chair Joaquin's motion on the A3 amendment. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those say nay. The motion does prevail. The A3 amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Katitsa Watoon, 
to House File 2675 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, it's gonna be back in taxes. House File 2675 is a proposal to enhance and adapt the regulatory framework of the direct to consumer wine shipping industry. Like so many other online businesses, this wine shipping channel has experienced massive growth during the past two years due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in 2021, the direct to consumer industry hit over $4 billion in shipments, according to the Ship Compliant Report by Solos. Many new buyers entered this direct to consumer channel in 2020 during the height of the pandemic and domestic wineries seem to have retained those new buyers. This proposal creates licensing structure and tax parity with Minnesota wineries and retailers and provides a small expansion of volume available for direct shipment annually. The legislation treats both Minnesota wineries and out of state wineries the same as far as shipping requirement and requiring licenses shippers will report the same information for wine shipped from Minnesota or into the state. This is beneficial for these small businesses and for the consumers who are wishing to purchase wine without having to travel to a winery on site. The bill removes the excise tax exemption for shipments of wine to Minnesota residents and is written in section eight subdivision four uh, requires that direct wine shippers collect and remit liquor gross receipts tax, apply for permitting and collect and remit sales and use tax and provide a report that details each shipment of wine made to a resident of Minnesota. This bill has been in the works for some time. Former Representative Lesh carried this proposal in the previous biennium where it did successfully pass in the House. This proposal is supported by the industry, including the Wine Institute, the Minnesota Municipal Beverage Association, the Minnesota Licensed Beverage Association, the Beer Wholesalers, the Wine and Spirit Wholesalers, and the Teamsters. Mr. Chair, I would now ask that uh, Mr. Joel Carlson share a little bit more about the detail of the legislation, and then we will stand for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Katitsa Watoon. And before we do that, Representative Miller, Representative Schultz are now in attendance. And I would like to go over the revenue estimate at this time uh, for fiscal year 23. It actually is a brings in uh, $140,000. And in 24, it's $180,000 uh, positive, and in 25 brings in $220,000. Uh, Joel Carlson, uh, Mr. Carlson, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Representative Katiza Batoon did a great job uh, introducing uh, the bill. I'm Joel Carlson. I own a legal research and government affairs business here in St. Paul. Uh, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Wine and Spirit Wholesalers Association. And this may be, Mr. Chairman, the last time I get to appear before you. Uh, and, and so I want to say thank you to you for all of your service and friendship over your long tenure. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate having you as my legislator. Uh, the, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Carson. Appreciate that. The, uh, uh, the bill, the, the operative things for us in industry is, uh, in this committee is to bring tax parity for people that are shipping product into Minnesota and bringing parity to uh, Minnesota-based wineries uh, and retailers and wholesalers. And this bill does that. The two main points in the bill that we care about in this committee are on page two, lines 21, uh, which eliminates the current exemption from them paying excise tax. And on page four, line two, that, uh, that deems wine being shipped into this state is not a sale in this state. And so we'd appreciate uh, the committee's uh, continued support for this bill uh, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions about this or if there are questions about the A3 amendment, that's something I worked on as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlson. Uh, is, let me ask first, is there anyone else here that uh, would like to testify that was not on the list to House File 2675 as amended? See none. Members, do you have any questions for Representative Katitsa Batoon or Mr. Carlson or comments on the bill? I mean, it, it sounds to me like we're trying to create some parity and fairness here. Representative Stevenson. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I was uh, delayed in a, a meeting right before committee, so I, I was a little bit late. I had, it, had intended to offer an amendment. I don't know if that 
uh, got on uh, the bill before uh, I, I arrived. We did uh, adopt an A3 amendment. Thank you. That is the amendment that I was hoping would be adopted. So I appreciate the, the time. And I apologize for being late again. Very good. Thank you. Uh, any other members? If not, Representative Katitsa would tune your closing arguments, statements. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I appreciate your consideration of this bill. Um, I think it's going to do a lot of good to um, to the consumers of, of wine across the state, as well as to our local wineries, who um, you know currently are um, are paying tax on um, on their product. And um, and I think that it also is helpful because we did speak about in our last in the last committee stop. Um, right now, in order, if you want to buy more than two cases of wine from any given winery, you have to visit them in person. So as we have so many uh, wonderful local wineries across the state of Minnesota, um, if, if we people aren't able to travel to them or, you know, they just um, want a more of a purchase of convenience, they can order from not only in-state wineries, more than two cases, but across the country as well. So um, appreciate the consideration and support and uh, that it's a good bill. Um, hopefully we can uh, have it included in the tax bill. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Katiza, uh, Representative Katitsa Watoon. Uh, the chair will lay over House File 2675 uh, as amended. Uh, next, thank you. Next bill on the calendar is House File 3551. Representative Baker, welcome to the committee. And uh, before uh, we go to you, who would like to move House File 30, uh, 3551. I'll move his bill, Mr. Chairman. Very good, thank you. Representative McDonald moves House File 3551 uh, for possible inclusion into the omnibus tax bill. Uh, Representative Baker, uh, again, welcome to the committee and uh, tell us about House File 3551. I would be happy to do so, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak on behalf of my uh, great industry uh, the hospitality industry is looking for uh, a fix of something that was critical for us to stay alive with many of our operators uh, here through the, through the last couple of years. Um, the uh, restaurant revitalization uh, grant program was critical for folks to be able to keep the lights on, keep their employees going. And part of our fix last year, Mr. Chair and members, is we didn't get a chance to to make this conform with the uh, with the uh, IRS code and and this is, is a taxable income right now which is coming up and due in a very short amount of time, uh, we really need to make sure that our committee knows of the urgency of this uh, this bill. We've got a, a, about 1,700 members or restaurants in the state of Minnesota that received this. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, I have uh, uh, Ben Wagelson from the Hospitality of Minnesota that can speak a little bit more to the details, and I'll I'll turn my balance of time over to him, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Representative Baker. And before we do that, the revenue estimate for House File 3551 for 2023 is $8.7 million. And then in 24, it's 800,000. And in 25, it is 400,000. So uh, I have first on the list, uh, Bill Collins. Yeah, it's me. Mr. Yeah, Collins. It's Mr. Collins, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Thanks. My name is Bill Collins, and I own Camp Bar and Cabaret in downtown St. Paul. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, the past two years have nearly wiped us all out uh, in the entertainment hospitality industry. We personally can't get back to regular hours yet. We can't get enough staff. We are still very much struggling. And despite that, I recently wrote the largest check in my company's history. And that check was to the heavily surplus state of Minnesota to pay income tax on a relief grant we got from the federal government that was supposed to help me keep my doors open. Writing that check to the state of Minnesota is not helping me keep my doors open and keep my employees working. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Next, I have Ben Wagsland. Uh, with Hospitality Minnesota. Mr. Wagsland, welcome to the committee and please state your testimony. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and members and staff. My name is Ben Wagsland. Uh, I'm the Executive Vice President of Hospitality Minnesota, representing Minnesota's restaurant and food service, uh, hotel and lodging and resort and campground industries. Uh, appreciate just a couple minutes of your time here today. 
you know, we've talked about this issue when the governor's tax bill came up, uh, RRF re, uh, revitalization funds, but we really appreciate you hearing this as a standalone bill here today, Mr. Chair, because there is an urgency. Mr. Collins just reflected on it and a number of other operators, probably the remainder of restaurant operators, those 1700 Representative Baker mentioned are gonna be paying taxes on this uh, come April 15th. So there's an urgency to this issue. Uh, these folks are facing other headwinds. Uh, and I just wanna go through real quick, our most recent survey data that we've uh, acquired since the last time I, I was able to brief the committee. Uh, you might've seen, some of you might've seen this on the news last night. Our economic snapshot shows that 64% of food service uh, businesses in Minnesota receive lower than normal revenue here in Q1, and about half are expecting lower than normal revenue here in Q2. Again, about half of food service uh, businesses are projecting that uh, they won't get back to normal revenue until 2023, and about half are concerned about solvency in the next six to 12 months at the current rate of, of business. So while there, you might see you know, volume coming back to restaurants and might see people out and about and customer demand coming back. There are some very real concerns about being able to, to make it uh, through and be able to get back to being productive businesses. Uh, on top of those things, uh, the workforce shortage is really a, a huge challenge for these restaurants right now. It's causing them to spend more money uh, uh, on, on labor costs, uh, as well as uh, servicing debt that they took on due to COVID. Uh, two thirds of restaurants took on debt due to COVID at an average debt amount of five hundred thousand uh, dollars. Finally, uh, inflation is another uh, headwind that they're facing financially, as fifty nine percent of operators, uh, according to the the survey here, are facing inflation of five or ten percent or more on the goods and services that uh, they need to run their businesses. Uh, so far, only about thirty nine percent are passing those uh, in increases onto the consumer. Uh, and I think that's due to a concern about what the market will bear, what customers will pay. Uh, and so that's another squeeze that we're seeing there. So in our view, all this adds up to uh, these folks certainly can't afford to, an additional tax burden uh, right now. And we think it makes sense for the legislature to act quickly and do what it did last year on PPP and those other government programs and conform to the federal standard. I will note that Wisconsin, just to our east, passed their bill uh, and I believe the governor signed it just in the last week here as a standalone. Uh, and we would uh, we would love it if the committee would be willing to take a look at that here in the next few weeks uh, prior to that April 15th deadline. Uh, thank you for your time, everyone. And uh, we appreciate you. And I'm here to answer any questions if, if that's helpful to the committee. Thank you. Mr. Wagslin, thank you so much. And I appreciate the conversations you and I have, and you've been a great advocate caring you know, the message for just, uh, we know that the leisure and hospitality industry was hit harder than all the other ones. And I um, appreciate your work on this. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to testify on House File 3551? All right, members, uh, any uh, representative McDonald? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I got a question for Mr. Collins. Um, uh, Mr. Collins? Yep, he's on. Go ahead. Good, Mr. Collins, uh, thank you for your uh, testimony and I've uh, been to your fine establishment. Good food, good atmosphere, a good ambiance. So I'm sorry to hear that things aren't uh, you know, A plus yet. Uh, we pray that they will continue to be. But in uh, some of your challenges, would you say the number one uh, challenge is the workforce shortage, other than that big check you wrote, which I have another question regarding that? Minnesota. Mr. Collins. Uh, yes, certainly for us, the biggest issue is staffing. Um, we're opening later and we're closing earlier. And those are hours which we'd normally be generating revenue that we are no longer doing so. And finding qualified staff that are willing to work. Um, challenges with people feeling safe working in downtown St. Paul late night is a big issue. Um, and, and just finding any sort of an applicant is a big issue. Uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Mr. Collins, so feeling safe downtown, you mean as far as their own personal safety because of the crime? Is that what you meant safe or how do you mean safe? Yeah, yeah, safety issues. Mr. Collins, Representative McDonald. Yeah, that's a darn shame. That, that's, that's sickening, that's maddening. I feel your pain there. We're told by our Sergeant of Arms around the Capitol to be careful because we're not safe. 
uh, we need to definitely get a handle of that, but that's not the issue before us. Uh, last question for Representative Baker, the author. Um, in regards to what Mr. Collins paid to the state recently uh, through the, that, was that PPP money or what, what exactly do we owe? Because I thought that we forgave the, uh, the tax on that. What, what am I not seeing here? Representative Baker. Yeah, Mr. Chair and Representative McDonald, uh, we did the PPP loan, we got that right. This was a smaller component to the federal relief and the, and the work that we did uh, that all of us kind of supported getting the work out, but this piece was missed in the, in the compliance. And again, if I misstated that, I'll have uh, uh, Ben speak up to that if I misspoke, but it's a part that we thought we handled. Uh, it got flipped through, there was a couple other little uh, programs out there. But again, I think the bottom line that you're hearing from Mr. Collins and so many other uh, Representative McDonald is, is uh, the one thing we shouldn't do as a state is try to make money on the delivery of, that, of those funds to try to keep their lights on. So uh, we need this as quickly as we can, uh, but this one got missed last year. So we are not in compliance with the federal um, Internal Revenue Service Code. So uh, unless I answered that incorrectly, I'll have Ben uh, clarify, Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald, or, or Mr. Waxland, did you wanna? Mr. Chair, thank you, and, and Representative McDonald. Uh, Representative Baker is correct. Um, the reason that um, that uh, the previous testifier uh, already paid that, so depending on how your business is structured, you either would have had to pay taxes on it on March 15th or here coming up on April 15th. And so, you know, the goal would be that if the legislature passes uh, this legislation, hopefully Mr. Collins will get a refund. But in our conversations with the Department of Revenue, uh, it, you know, it seems to make more sense for the legislature to act ahead of time, uh, as with the UI trust fund issue, rather than having to try to inefficiently provide refunds after the fact, which you know, costs additional money to the state and resources to, uh, to have to manage that. So that's the issue as, as it sits before us right now. It's those restaurant revitalization fund grants it went to 1,700 restaurants in Minnesota for about $500 million of relief. Representative McDonald. Thank you. So, uh, yes. I'm gonna... Oh, I'm sorry, let me just finish. No, I'm okay. sorry, yep, yeah, Representative McDonald. Yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, I appreciate the answer and uh, certainly uh, uh, support the bill, Representative Baker. And uh, certainly we hope that we can get the uh, uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance passed this year or sooner than later, so we don't have to, uh, you know, go back and make amends like this bill will do. So that's all I have for now, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative McDonald. I'm going to call on staff uh, because last year in the House omnibus tax bill, we had uh, conformity for both 2020 and 2021. And just to make sure, was this restaurant revitalization grant included in the House out of this tax bill last year? And I, that be Mr. Williams. I just, I mean, I don't have that in front of me. I know we passed a number of items, but I just would like to be clear on Ms. Templin. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, the question is if the restaurant revitalization grants um, in conformity was included in the 2021 tax bill. I do not. Um, that is that provision is a American Rescue Plan provision and conformity to that provision was not included in the 2021 House tax omnibus bill. Okay. So that, that provision was not in there. Correct. Okay, very good. So uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Baker for bringing this bill. Just um, if staff could clarify, if we are not taking action on this until the omnibus bill is complete at the end of session, won't that necessitate a similar refund process like we just went through with PPP, we would have to get this done by tax filing period in order for this not to go through that process again. Uh, is that for, was that for me, Representative Robbins, or was that? For Ms. Someone? Templin or someone on the nonpartisan yeah, staff. So, uh, Chair Mark. So Rep Representative Robbins, uh, I mean, well, okay, Mr. Williams, who wants to go ahead, Mr. Williams? Uh, Chair Markworth and Representative Robbins, I think that's correct that uh, if 
the, the bill was not passed until the end of session um, and it was effective retroactively for tax years 2021, 20, uh, then presumably you'd have to file an amended return to benefit from the division. Very good. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I would encourage the committee to consider just letting this go to the general register. We don't need to put our businesses through that. The omnibus bill will be big and cover a lot of things, but if we could possibly make this simple change, not have to go through refunds and the whole process that they went through for the PPP um, refund, I think it would be just a great encouragement to businesses to show them that we are really trying to help them. So, uh, well, thank you very much, Representative Robbins. And um, first of all, I mean, filing started January 24th, so we're a couple months already behind. So there's already many that, as Mr. Collins said, who has already, you know, made that. And, you know, the House effort last year is we included much of 2021 conformity that we wanted to do which would have solved a lot of concerns. We could already had that in state law, but the Senate didn't want to do that. But I, I will uh, disagree with you with the fact that the state has not um, helped businesses during COVID. And I just saw a list and, you know, I never like to use numbers unless I have them right in front of me, but it's literally uh, not even counting the PPP conformity which was over $400 million. There are several hundred million of other dollars of state help to businesses. So uh, I will take some exception that we're not helping businesses as a state. I think we have stepped forward in many cases. Now, is everyone held harmless? And, and you know, absolutely not. COVID has had a huge impact and it hit businesses. It hit people disproportionately. Uh, but I think the state has done very well in trying to react as quickly as possible in dealing with a lot of this. So um, uh, should we take, you know, we're going to get this taken care of. I will tell you it will be in our conformity in the tax bill. Uh, but it, you know, I mean, it probably isn't going to happen until we have the tax bill uh, towards the end. Uh, Representative Robbins, anything more you wanted to yeah, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Chair, and I did not mean to imply the state had not helped. I just think um, in some of the, the processes of how we've gone about it, it has been clumsy at best with uh, we did the PPP refund, and I would just like to not repeat that if possible, but if that's where we're at, I guess we'll have to live with it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative Robbins. Uh, Chair Joaquin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank Representative Baker for bringing this forward um, and lift up. Representative Marquardt did fight until the bitter end for a lot of the conformity that the House put in our bill last year that took care of a lot of these items. I'm sorry, this was sounds like it was missed, but I also wanted to ask, Mr. Collins, if I heard you right, you said you'd already you'd already made this payment. And as Chair Marquardt said, um, these payments were in um, the bills came out in January. I just wanted to make sure I understood the timeline. Miss, was that a question for Mr. Collins, Chair? Yes. Mr. Collins, would you? Uh, taxes are awfully complicated. I do what my accountant tells me. Uh, I have partners, and we needed to get K-1s issued so that they could do their personal taxes. Um, so we needed to get our tax return into the state so that our partners could get their K-1s and deal with their tax situation. And so he advised me to make a prepayment so that we could file our return and get the K-1s to our partners, knowing that we may have to go back now and amend our returns. But it would be a happy amendment to make to my return. Thank you. Uh, Chair Joaquin. Thank you, Mr. Collins, for clearing that up. And yes, you're right, taxes are complicated. And like I said, I want to thank Representative Baker for bringing this forward and Representative Marquardt for um, making sure it was heard and that we could um, get this done this year. Thank you, Chair Joaquin. Uh, Mr. Waxlin, did you have a reference to this, to Chair Joaquim's question? Is that, I see your hand is up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Joaquim, uh, just for further context on that. So uh, beyond just the taxes are complicated, um, the 
you know, if some companies in Minnesota were required to file on the 15th of March, as we understand it from talking with revenue individuals and it's a lot of restaurants that will file as individuals or through different status are going to be required to file it by the 15th of April. So that's the time sensitivity here of those folks that haven't uh, filed it yet due to other uh, adv advantages they might have gotten on the employee retention tax credit or other federal pieces. Um, so that's the, the difference between someone who might have filed it early on or by that March deadline or April deadline, as we understand it from the Revenue Department. Hopefully, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, no, thank you, Mr. Wagsland. Uh, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and this is a question for you. Let's, let's say if we pass this as a standalone bill, we send it to the House floor. I think the other body, the Senate has already got theirs squared away. How fast could we get it through the system? That probably might need a conference committee. I don't know, but how get the fastest? What would be the fastest way to get it through? Well, I if if you gave if they Mr. gave you the green light. <laughs> yes, yes, Representative Detmer, and I mean it, it's you never know for sure how quickly because you have the other body. But you know, one thing with the tax bill is the House constitutionally the tax bill has to start in the House. And uh, the tax conformity that we will do, the federal tax conformity is gonna be over $100 million. And it's gonna be part of a larger package uh, that we're going to have. But if you send one piece over, there's no guarantee what the Senate does. And then that's our tax bill. And they, we get back, so it just could actually, in the long run, slow up the process rather than move it forward. And uh, I, I just, you know, you always take the sure thing and never count on something you don't have 100% control over. And that's kind of where I'm at as the tax chair. I just don't feel I have 100% control over what the other body will do. <laughs> and that leaves me just a little nervous. Um, somewhat like you would have been before uh, uh, your team title match with Forest Lake that year. So it would have been some butterflies. Well, I, you know, I, Representative I, Detmer. Mr. Chair, and I, I can agree with you. I know, but if uh, I think if you were given the green light, and uh, the Senate uh, got their the other body got their their way squared away, I think I've seen things happen in a hurry around here sometimes. And and you're right, sometimes it takes a long time. But sometimes uh, with an issue like this, we could get it out the door and, and take care of our businesses. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. So Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I appreciate that, Representative Depper. And there, you know, there's other issues that others could bring, frontline workers, these other issues we brought forward that we would like to all move forward. And we've talked about a number of these issues on, yeah. on kind of both sides. And um, it just, yes. So I appreciate that, Representative Depper. Uh, any other comments on House File 3551 from members or questions? If not, good discussion. Representative Baker, um, closing comments. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. I think what we what we we can understand and agree to, and again, for you having a hearing today, Mr. Chairman, is, is your signal that this is important to you and in your in your team. I appreciate that. But also with the restaurants and the procedures that we have here in the process, what we're talking about is if there is a way to do it, it's on me now and others uh, to help the Senate make sure that they get it. Uh, the other body to get it where it needs to be. And maybe we can find a way to keep it clean, keep it from getting all cumbered up. And we all know this process can be somewhat uh, uh, messy, but there are times when sometimes we just have to work together. Uh, I just, right now, I needed this hearing. And I thank you for that. And our restaurants, thank you for that today. And Mr. Collins uh, and, and the work that he's doing and 1,600 other of his operators uh, like him, we do need to do this. And as legislators, we do the best we can. And the process we have, and we do have to continue to just challenge our processes to do these better. So Mr. Chair, you've done everything you can right now, but I will continue to work on the backside to try to convince you and others that maybe we can try to help some that are really in an urgent matter. So uh, I just am grateful for this today and thank you so much for your time. And Representative Baker, thanks so much. And you've really championed this um, during this entire COVID-19. So I appreciate that. And this certainly is a um, top priority, high priority for uh, this committee. So thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, the, the chair will lay over House File 3551.
Uh, next bill up is House File 3828. Representative Sandell, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have an amendment. Uh, very good. So uh, go ahead and first of all, move 3828, if you would, please. I appreciate uh, moving uh, House File 3828 before this committee and um, uh, consider it for laying it over. All right, very good. Uh, now I, I see an A1 amendment. Would you like to move the A1 amendment? I do. The A1 amendment is offered here to conform uh, language in this bill with the one authored by Senator Clausen and heard in the Senate Tax Committee. And uh, I'd move uh, that we uh, um, adopt the A1 amendment. Thank you. Excuse me, members. Uh, Representative Sandell uh, moves the A1 amendment. Is there any thoughts on that before we can go to the vote? Uh, we'll go to the vote on the A1 amendment. Temporarily unmute yourself. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Sandell, House File 3828 as amended. Mr. Chair, thanks very much. That's the first uh, unanimous vote I've had for a long while. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members and staff, uh, uh, thanks very much for hearing this bill. Uh, House file 3828 comes to us from the Department of Revenue and the Senate where it had, uh, where it's sponsored by DFL or uh, an, independent, uh, uh, an independent Senator and a Republican member as well. That's heard, as I mentioned in the tax committee over there last week. 3828 would confirm, conform state policies and regulations to the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act, enacted in March 2020, and expanded to expand, which expanded the exclusion for employer-provided educational assistance programs to include student loan payments made by an employer on behalf of an employee up to $5,250. As originally enacted, the exclusion applied to tax year 2020 only. It was later extended through the tax year 2025 by the Consolidated Appropriation Act in 2021. Minnesota has not, until now, conformed to the exclusion. Under this proposal, the exclusion for employer student loan payments from the CARES Act and the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2021 would be adopted retroactively to 2020 and through 2025. A fiscal note uh, is in the materials provided for today's hearing. The impact is not insignificant, but as the graphs included in the material pro, uh, provided indicate that student debt has become both onerous and much too common. This provision can be of substantial assistance and members would like your support for 3828. I'll answer the questions the best I can, but uh, staff I'm sure would be able to do a more concise job. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Sandell, and I appreciate you bringing this um, forward. Student loans uh, is a, a big issue we're looking at trying to deal with and, and get students out from that avalanche of, avalanche of student debt. Um, uh, just so members, there is a chart that was included here uh, looking at um, graduate median debt by academic award received. Uh, so, Miss. Um, template. Well, let me read the revenue estimate for House File 3828 as amended. So for 2023, it's 19.3 million, for 24, 7.3 million, and for 2025, 7.4 million. And members, I've been reading all these revenue estimates, not because you don't have it, but just for those who are viewing and that, that may not have those materials in front of them. But Ms. Templin, is the higher revenue estimate of 19.3 million in 23, is that because of the retroactivity going back to 2020 or what, what causes that? Ms. Um, Templin. Yes, Mr. Chair, the, um, the revenue estimate for the bill as amended picks up the, um, picks up the retroactivity as you, as you um, just described. And it uh, would make the bill uh, or the um, the exclusion effective for tax years twenty through twenty five. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Stamplin. Uh, any? I don't see any testifiers on the list. Is there anyone who would like to testify on House File thirty eight twenty eight? I don't see anyone. Members, questions? Well. 
Representative Sandel, not only unanimous on that uh, amendment, but I, I mean, no, no comments. Would you like to conclude with some final comments, Representative Sandel? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's the most I've laughed for three months. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were able to do that in the tax committee, so. Well, members, thanks very much for taking time to hear this. As someone said earlier, the taxes are complicated, and they certainly are. Um, but I appreciate the help that staff has given me and uh, the time that uh, Chair Marquardt has. I uh, would um, like your endorsement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Sandell. The chair will lay over House File 3828. Uh, next, we have House File 3564, and our own member, Representative uh, Robbins. Um, would you like to move the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move the bill. All right, uh, Representative Robbins moves uh, House File 3564 for possible inclusion. And I see there is an A2 amendment. Would you like to move the amendment? Yes, Mr. Ch Chair, I move the A2. All right, Representative Robbins moves the A2 amendment. And I know it makes significant changes, but I, I just would rather have this on as you go over the bill as amended. So members, I would ask that uh, we just put on this amendment at, that, at this time. That's all right. All right, I'd like to call for the vote on the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion does prevail. The A2 amendment is adopted. Representative Robbins to House File 3564 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, this bill focuses on Minnesota's most important asset, our workers, and will provide benefits to both employers and employees. It creates a tax incentive to encourage greater investment in workforce training that will help improve and enhance the skills of workers and improve profitability and competitiveness for Minnesota's existing businesses. As we have all heard from the state demographer, we um, are in a significant 15 year period with flat uh, growth in population. And that requires us to look at new policies to encourage economic growth. Um, the long-term trends that are projected over the coming decade are due to structural factors like low birth rates and low migration rates. And they constrain our traditional model of economic growth that relies on job growth and expanding output. We need instead to focus on human capital development to drive increasing economic performance. It's less about job creation and more about improving talent and the productivity of our workforce. And as you know, as productivity rises, so do wages. So this bill will create a workforce uh, training tax credit that allows a non-refundable tax credit of 50% of eligible training expenses up to $750 per employee. Um, and that amount is committed at $100,000 per employer per year. And the training must be provided by the employer directly or through a contractor um, or by a post-secondary or other educational institution. The amendment um, makes sure that we're not double dipping by disallowing expensing of those training costs. So um, members, um, that's the sum of the bill. It really will matter for our future productivity. Yesterday, Senator Rosen and I um, had hosted some folks from the Confederation of British Industry talking about what um, uh, they're looking for when they consider foreign direct investment in Minnesota. Right now, um, the UK is our ninth large, largest trading partner, and um, they employ about 22,000 people in Minnesota. And they said the number one thing they look for is skilled workforce. And when they're comparing us with other states, these incentive programs matter and our, the skill level of our workforce is essential for attracting new investment to our state. So with that members, I um, uh, welcome any questions. I think there's a couple of testifiers. Uh, Representative Robbins, there are a few testifiers and we will go to them in just a second. Uh, the revenue estimate for House File 3564 as amended is um, in 2023, 120.1 million. 24, 121.8 million, and in 25, 122.8 million. Uh, so with that, we have uh, John Reynolds and then Beth Cadoon. Uh, Mr. Reynolds, well, welcome to the tax committee. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Marquardt. It's a pleasure to join you all today. I'm John Reynolds, State Director for NFIB in Minnesota. We're the state's largest small business organization with over 10,000 members in every corner of the state. 
uh, we're happy to support House File 3564, uh, which would help small businesses offset the costs of training new employees. Labor scarcity and labor quality are two of the top issues facing small businesses right now. Uh, shortages aren't just in high growth industries, they exist across the board. Uh, in NFIB's most recent jobs report, 93% of small businesses reported few or no qualified applicants for open positions. Almost half of small employers reported openings they couldn't fill, more than double NFIB's historic average. Uh, and more reported labor costs is a top problem than at any time in nearly 50 years. In response, record numbers of small employers are raising pay, increasing paid time off, increasing overtime, and working more hours themselves to try to keep up. Uh, together with supply chain disruptions, inflation, and soaring energy costs, workforce, issue, workforce issues are driving up prices, cutting in sales, and hurting Main Street businesses. I talk to small employers every week who are struggling to find workers. Many are taking more chances on younger people, people returning to the workforce, or those transitioning from another line of employment. However, it often takes significant time and resources to train, to train and develop these hires. And while small business owners pay the state workforce development assessment, it's not simple for them to access state grants uh, and programs for worker training. Uh, tax credit is a simple, understandable mechanism for them to offset training costs, help them grow, and allow them to compete. Thank you again for considering this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, <clears throat> next up, Beth Kadoon. Welcome to the committee, and please uh, introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I appreciate the opportunity to has testify today. And thank you to Representative Robbins for bringing forth this bill. We are in strong support of this. The, I'm, hopefully I said my name, I'm not sure if I did. Beth Kadoon with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. The Minnesota Chamber focuses on policies to help improve Minnesota's business climate and grow our economy. The top two concerns we hear from our businesses impeding their ability to grow in our state is Minnesota's shortage of workers, as well as our tax and regulatory environment. This bill really helps with both concerns by helping reduce taxes and encourage greater productivity and upskilling of workers, benefiting both the employer and the employee. The Minnesota Chamber Foundation undertook an extensive review of Minnesota's position in the national and global economy and released recommendations on, on how to shape and foster economic performance in the coming decade in their Minnesota 2030 report. The report highlighted the fact that slow population and labor force growth will continue to constrain job and economic growth over the next day, decade or more. And as was mentioned, as our Minnesota's employment growth slows, productivity will need to drive our GDP growth. As Minnesota will not be growing our economy as we have in the past through adding more jobs and people, but instead through improving our productivity with investments and innovation, as well as upskilling our workforce. We know Minnesota's highly skilled, talented, and reliable workforce has been our competitive advantage and one of our key strengths for generations. Investing in worker skills is becoming more important, especially with our technology improvements that require a constant need to train and upskill. We know investments in a human capital will improve our worker work productivity, help spur innovation, and provide the pathways for upward mobility. There was some research by Aspen Institute that supported a similar tax credit, um, found that the benefits of training reside primarily with the worker rather than with the business. And there will always be a portion of the investment that benefits the overall economy, but not the business itself. As we see, workers are more apt to make career jumps than in the past, which is not necessarily a bad thing. However, what this means is is that businesses have a more difficult time capturing the return on their training investments. The result can be less investment in training at the same time our, econ our economy is gonna require a more highly skilled workforce. So we urge you to support this tax credit as we believe it will make workforce training investments less costly and more attractive to employers, benefit employees and help in our state's economic growth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kadoon. Is there anyone else that wants to testify um, on House File 3564 as amended? Seeing none. So uh, this is Representative Robbins or maybe Mr. Reynolds or Ms. Kadoon. Um, I, was, I was looking through the revenue estimate, it didn't really say kind of numbers, but would you know roughly how many employees and if you don't have this number, I, I mean, roughly that this might include for training uh, in, a, in a year. And then 
are there certain types of occupations where you might have higher turnover where there would be a more need for training? So I, I don't know if you have those that information, any of the three. Mr. Chair. And Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have those exact numbers and I would you know, welcome someone else to jump in, but I did wanna say that one of the things the amendment does is it makes sure that we are focusing on lower wage and middle wage workers. So the amendment changed the threshold. So people are only, employees are only eligible if they're in the first or second income tax tier in Minnesota. So we are focused on upskilling workers in those two lower tiers. And I think that really, um, Will make a difference and also um, I did want to point out that the fiscal note um, indicated that um, you know there will be a split between those who uh, pay with corporate tax versus um, through S corps or individual income tax and it was 60 40. So um, hopefully that gives a little bit of insight but if anyone knows and there's no industry specific guidelines in the bill so any industry can take advantage of it. No, thank you very much, Representative Robin. So, Ms. Cadoon, I saw your hand. Did you want to? Yeah, I'll just mention, I don't have the exact um, data you were just asking for about how many currently use, um, do workforce training. We do mo know most of our companies do some sort of training for their workers. Um, but there was a, some, when I mentioned the Aspen Institute that had looked at this training tax credit and was supporting it at the federal level, they had done some analysis and modeling when they were looking at it. And they said at that point, they believe it would lead to increased training investments by 8.5%. So with the idea that it's to encourage more, more investment in hopefully in our Minnesota oper operations and workforce. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Cherry Joaquin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And some of your questions kind of led where I was asking too. So an in, uh, increase of 8.5% I heard for training and I, um, Representative Robbins, I wanna thank you for the amendment and kind of shrinking some of those numbers, wondering you know, maybe if there's a way we could target it even more because that price tag is a little bit bigger, but two quick questions for you. Um, Maybe I'm spending way too much time in the property tax world and talking about tax increment financing, but we have this little but for test when it comes to TIF and wondering, but for this credit, isn't this most of this training already happening or how is this going to encourage new training? Because I know um, the business world can't stay stagnant. They are always having to evolve and move and retain employees and train them and make sure things are working efficiently and effectively in their in their businesses. So I'm just wondering how much of this training will actually, how much more training will actually happen because of this tax credit, or is this just a tax credit for training that's already occurring? Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Iwa Kim. Um, I think it's a great question. And first, I am, I, I would be open to narrowing it. Um, we have already, I think, taken significant steps in that direction, but I would be open to that. But I really think that the bigger question is why will this incent more training? And basically it's because rather than the, just um, doing the expensing, this will give companies a bigger incentive by creating it as a credit. And so those companies that are on the bubble, I mean, budgets are tight. I mean, we all know that everyone's expenses have gone up dramatically for wages, for um, uh, inflation, for uh, the cost of uh, inputs, so as they're looking at what they're going to spend on training, that's probably falling down further on the list. So this provides an incentive to keep training as a priority for these companies, and that will benefit workers and, and frankly, our economy, because we're, we're not going to have enough workers to, to meet the need. We need to provide training. And, and, and if I can just give a plug, I really think businesses know best what they need to train for. And I have we spend $130 million or we, we collect taxes from businesses, $130 million on the workforce development tax. And most businesses can't take advantage of that, especially small ones, because they don't have the staff to write grants or get through those hoops. And this is a way all businesses, small businesses, medium businesses can target training that meets their needs rather than going through that workforce development fund, which I personally haven't, when I served on the jobs committee, didn't see it as super effective. So I think this, this will make the market help foster the training that we need. Sherry Joaquim, any follow-up? Yeah. 
And Mr. Chair, a follow up and then one other quick question. So no, completely understand how tight budgets are everywhere. I've been working on a bill for four years now to get the right kind of training for our paraprofessionals that work with some of our most vulnerable kids in our schools. So I know training budgets are tight. Um, I, I understand that just wondering, and I'm glad you'll, you'll think about maybe narrowing a little bit further. But um, other quick question too is, uh, this committee worked really hard on a tax expenditure working group and looking at tax expenditures. And I appreciate the fact that you put the purpose statement in, but then with your amendment, you took out um, the sunset. And we're talking about having all new tax expenditures having a sunset so we can revisit them. So maybe explain why you took the sunset out. Yes, Representative Madam Chair. Representative Robbins. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, Chair, Chair Marquardt and Chair Joachim. So my understanding, this was first taken out in the Senate, but my understanding is the reason they did that is because we passed a bill last year to require um, eight year um, sunset dates for all new tax expenditures. So since this is a new tax, ex tax expenditure, it will automatically fall under that eight year sunset is my understanding. No, no. Not with so, your amendment, sorry. <laughs> no. Well, Representative Robbins. Go I'm ahead, sorry. Madam yeah, Chair no, go ahead and finish, yeah. I, I do believe, or I was informed that the sunset isn't necessary because of what we passed last year, that all new tax expenditures will automatically go through that eight year sunset. So if that's not the case, I'm happy to put it back in, but, but I was told it would automatically expire in eight years anyway. Thank you, Representative Robbins. Chair Joachim. Yeah, Mr. Chair, and I might be reading the notwithstanding wrong, so maybe we can ask nonpartisan staff so we can both get it clearer because I think having it in statute, um, we all like belts and suspender language too. So I didn't know if um, nonpartisan staff can clear it up for me. I might be engrossing the bill myself the wrong way. Um, Mr. Chair. Williams, uh, Mr. Clayman. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I so, the bill as amended would not include a sunset. And so then I think the question would be, um, could that requirement under section 3.192 uh, be enforced by say a, a, a state court if there was litigation on the subject and, and impose an eight year sunset in the absence of that? With, with, but with the notwithstanding clause, um, that probably wouldn't happen, but I, I think there's an open question about um, whether that would be necessary. I think the, the, the general picture of the requirements in section 3.192 for the sunset date, um, I, I think it really comes down to the fact that the, the legislature can pass um, by and large uh, the bills that it wants with, with the expiration dates or, or the lack of expiration dates if it wants. Um, and, th and there are some questions about the enforceability. Um, but I think at, so I think given that, um, with those provisions on the sunset in the amendment, um, that the, the uh, bill as amended uh, would not uh, be subject to a sunset date. But again, that's um, contingent on assuming that if there was litigation on the subject, um, that 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 section 3.192 uh, that a court would not apply that as um, imposing a sunset date if one was not included in a particular bill. So oh, thank thank you, Mr. Clayman. So I think if we would want a sunset, we just would want it actually in the bill. Thank you, yep. Chair Joaquin, for bringing that up. Thank you, Mr. Clayman. Uh, Chair Joachim, anything else that you have follow up? No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clayman. I always count on nonpartisan staff to make sure I'm reading things right. So thank you. Uh, members, anything else on House File 3564 as amended? Uh, Representative uh, Robbins, uh, closing thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I appreciate the discussion and um, I look forward to working with all of you. If you have additional suggestions on the bill, I would welcome that. And uh, Chair Joachim, I, I will work with my Senate counterparts to make sure we're clear on the sunset provisions because um, I want to make sure we're all on the same page on how this will be dealt with. So thank you all very much.
Uh, thank you, Representative Robbins. Addressing all of these workforce concerns as you just talked about is, is very important. So thanks for bringing this forward. Uh, with that, uh, the chair will lay over House File 3564 as amended. Thank you, Representative Robbins. Uh, next up, we have House File 4042. Uh, Representative Leslegard, would you like to move your bill? So moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Leslegard moves House File 4042 for possible inclusion. You also have a, a DE3 author's amendment. Yes, I would like to move the DE. Uh, the the amendment so I can get the bill in the shape that uh, to present. All right, Representative Lesgard moves the DE3 amendment. And um, I would like as the chair if we could just put this on and then he could talk to the uh, bill as amended. So with that, members, I'd like to call for the vote on the DE3 author's amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those, oppo those opposed, please say nay. The motion does prevail. Uh -huh. uh, the DE3 author's amendment is adopted. Representative Leslegard to oh, House File 4042 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, in 2014, the Minnesota legislature created an Iron Range school account funded by Taconite taxes, which are in lieu of property taxes. Taconite production tax are the taxes paid on concentrate or pellets in lieu of property taxes. These local tax dollars are then returned to cities, townships, counties, school districts, and homeowners throughout the Taconite Assistance Area. The legislature's foresight and action in 2014 has helped several school districts invest in uh, renovating school buildings, new construction, and infrastructure. And then also it uh, innovated uh, summer school programs across um, several schools that have been an incredible success. This program was funded by repurposing funds from existing production tax. This was not a new tax, but rather reallocation of funds dedicated to schools. In uh, 2023, part of this funding is scheduled to sunset. This bill in front of you extends these funds equivalent to five cents per ton and dedicates it to the school fund for the next 20 years. After 20 years, the five cents would return to use for economic and environmental causes. This would allow for further investment in school projects like proposed in Hibbing and Chisholm. And with me today, um, I have a stellar lineup of testifiers that can um, tell you about their projects and the important need uh, for us to extend this. Very good. Thank you, Representative Lesligard. We will go to your testifiers. And first is Ann Elke and then uh, Adrian Norman. So, um, uh, Principal Elke, uh, welcome to the committee and state your name and please begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Marquardt, Vice Chair Lesligard, committee members. My name is Ann Elke and I am the elementary principal for the Independent School District 696 in Ely, Minnesota. I'm here to thank Representative Lizagard for introducing House File 4042. I also wanna thank the legislature for creating this fund back in 2014. This fund has done so much to improve educational facilities in Northeastern Minnesota, benefiting thousands of students and staff on our Iron Range. I'm here representing the Ely Public School District, which right now we're in the midst of a 20 plus million dollar renovation and expansion project. Our students and staff are excited to soon be in a newly remodeled and rejuvenated school building that has up-to-date vocational technical programs and 21st century learning spaces, a new gymnasium, and a new cafeteria where personally my elementary students will not have to put on their boots, hats, and mittens and cross an outdoor courtyard to get to their cafeteria anymore. Our classroom spaces will soon have the up-to-date technology we need to prepare our students for for the future. And most importantly for our students, families, and staff, our new school space will connect our two 100-year-old buildings with a modern, modern, centralized, secure entrance for the entire campus, which will enhance our safety measures to protect our students and staff. 
Finally, we are also excited that we will have updated ventilation systems in our 100-year-old buildings to circulate fresh air in our school classroom environments. All of this was possible because of the help the district received from taconite taxes, which are paid in lieu of property taxes. The, they are helping to pay for a portion of the school remodeling project matching the money that we were able to raise by local taxpayers through a voter approved referendum. Mr. Chair, Representative Liz Lagarde, thank you for bringing this bill forward. We look forward to seeing the opportunities other school districts in Northeastern Minnesota will have with the extension of this fund. I'm here to tell you it has made a tremendous difference in the lives of so many of our students and teachers in our Northern communities. Like you will probably hear from Chisholm and Hibbing next. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Principal Elke. Uh, before we knew, move to the next testifier, the revenue estimate has, uh, on House File 4042 as amended, has uh, nothing in 22 or 23, but in fiscal year, year 24, a $70,000 cost, and also in 2025, a $70,000 cost. And that's because it's assumed the Ely School District would increase its levy um, by about $600,000 uh, in 23 to start making the bond payments. So these are property tax interactions and income tax interactions. So um, members, that's the revenue estimate. Uh, next, we have Superintendent Adrian Norman. Thank you, Chair Marquardt, Vice Chair Liz Lagarde, Ranking Member Davids, members of the House Tax Committee. My name is Adrian Norman. I'm the Superintendent of the Chisholm Public Schools here on the Iron Range. Thank you to Representative Liz Lagarde for authoring this bill. I'm here to speak in favor of House File 4042. The Chisholm School District serves over, or over 700 students in three separate buildings. Two of the buildings are over 100 years old and are well past their useful lifespan. The third building is over 60 years old, has issues with asbestos and water diversion problems. There's a sump pump in that building that runs 24 seven and if it fails, the building will flood within two hours. With such old buildings, the emergency expenditures far outweigh the long-term facilities maintenance or LTFM budget. This year alone, we're sitting on around $136,000 in emergency repairs, as well as costly future scheduled water main replacement and boiler upgrades. The boiler systems have failed multiple times this year, as well as our electrical and fire safety systems, which has caused a major disruption in student learning and safety. Representative Liz Lagarde had a walking tour and since then, about three weeks ago, our boiler system has failed twice, including today where we had to send up someone from Duluth to come and do an emergency repair. Uh, we have a current boiler return pump that is broken that affects two of our buildings. And if it completely shuts down, we will close both buildings until mid-April when the parts are scheduled to appear. Our air handling units are undersized and struggled to provide the quality outdoor air needed for our classrooms during COVID. ADA compliance is also an issue with our old buildings and are uh, requiring costly upgrades. Our students, just like in Ely, have to go outside uh, to get to their breakfast and lunches, cross public roads to access the playground, cross a public road to uh, have bus pick up and drop off as well. These are very large safety concerns for us. To address these concerns, Chisholm would like to right-size our district with a modest project similar to Ely's, which would create one campus, streamlining our systems, providing a safe campus for our students. This investment would help our community greatly and your support of House File 4042 will allow us to likely move forward with a voter approved referendum and access additional school funds from this very important account. Your support of House File 4042 is important for improved public schools in Northern Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent Norman. And I see you're being joined today, it looks like probably by some school board members and also some students. And I wanna to say to the students, uh, it's great you're participating in the legislative process and you should ask your civics or government teacher to give you extra credit for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so uh, we're going to go to one more testifier and then we will um, uh, open it up to members questions. So we have school board member Kim McLaughlin from Hibbing Public Schools. 4042, Chair Marcourt, Vice Chair Lizagard, Ranking Member Davids and members of the House Tax Committee. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 4042. My name is Kim McLaughlin, and I am in my sixth year as a member of the Hibbing School Board. On behalf of the Hibbing School Board, the citizens of Hibbing, and our, our entire school community, I wish to express our sincere gratitude for your consideration in promoting and advocating for House File 4042. This important legislative initiative will assist the Hibbing Public Schools and the students of the Central Iron Range in meeting the demands of an ever-changing workforce. The Hibbing Public Schools are dedicated to providing the finest educational opportunities for our students. We understand that continued investments in technology, learning materials, classrooms, and infrastructure will allow the Hibbing Schools to advance our educational mission. House File 4042 will make possible the critically needed career and technology opportunities for students of the Central Iron Range by creating a 21st century technology center. It will also provide the investment necessary to bring advanced vocational and technical education to an important subset of our students. To improve student and staff safety with secure entrances, and to make other needed air quality updates. Hibbing High School is over 100 years old. This architectural masterpiece was built and fully funded through a generous, generous investment made with early mining revenue. Today, it is listed on the National Registry of Historic Buildings and is a source of pride for our community, our students, both current and alumni, and it is a beacon of education for our state. House File 4042 will allow for another investment in our schools. Again, made possible by the important production of minerals right here on the Iron Range. Our school district is not only committed to providing our students with a premier education, we are also deeply committed to maintaining our beautiful buildings. Having said that, we recognize that maintenance of a historical site brings with it added costs. House File 4042 would revive the mining investment in our schools by repurposing taconite tax revenue and earmarking these dollars for innovative projects that will secure the future of education in Hibbing and in Northern Minnesota. Today, I humbly ask for your support of House File 4042 for the future of both career and technology education at and in the Hibbing schools and for our students of Northern Minnesota. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, board member McLaughlin. Is there anyone else who would like to testify to House File 4042 as mandated? Uh, seeing none, Representative Garofalo, I know you had your hand up earlier. Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, my uh, question was answered. Okay, very good. Thank you. R Representative Detmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, during my coaching years, we would go up into Section 7 many times in Grand Rapids, Hibbing, Virginia, and wrestle tournaments there. And I'd always, when we're at Hibbing High School, I'd always take our team in to see the theater at Hibbing High School. It's just a marvelous uh, facility there. and. Uh, it's uh, quite a, you don't see another one like it in, in, the, in the state of Minnesota, I think so. But, and then for Representative Listergaard, I see you've got the presenting the flag. Now you've got the flag presented wrong. Uh, if you're looking at the flag, let's say if the, the American flag needs to be on the left, okay? If you're up on stage with the flag then the flag is right, which the same thing, the flag must be on the left if you're looking at the flag. So you see my my flags, that's the way you need to present them. So just just helping you out there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate Thank you, that. Representative Detmer, Representative Westlegard. I appreciate that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Chair Joachim. I just wanted to say thank you for bringing this forward, Representative Lizelgard. I know there's a lot of needs across our state, but in particular up in some of our schools on the Iron Range, I had a chance to visit the Ely Public Schools. And I know they're sick of hearing me say this in education finance um, around uh, when I was up on a family vacation, when I was at policy chair, wherever I was in the state, I stopped and talked to the school district. And they have some great needs on trying to connect those 
two buildings, especially so that their little uh, elementary school kids don't have to walk outside in the winter to get to the lunchroom. And that's, they have a very important project they're doing up there. And I have seen the inside of the Hibbing schools, but not gotten an official tour. So I'll have to do that next time I'm up in the area. So I just want to say thank you. This is needed. Thank you, Chair Joaquin. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Listegard. Oh, I'll let you fix that first. Uh, <laughs> Representative McDonald. It's more important than my question. See, Rep Representative Listegard, have you ever, uh, or what's your thoughts on uh, the school trust land and the great resources, especially up in the Iron Range, that our founding fathers here in Minnesota set aside uh, those great resources to help fund uh, education in all over the United States, uh, all over Minnesota, but in particular, of course, the Iron Range. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Representative Leslie Gard, do you want to go down the trust land education finance route or not? Yeah, but do you have well, any? Well, I, you know, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner, uh, or not Commissioner, I got a Commissioner McDonald, so uh, oh. Representative McDonald, that's a softball for me um, because uh, that is really, really important that uh, we follow the process, meet or exceed both state and federal standards and, uh, and extract these minerals to create more money into the fund. So um, that's my wheelhouse and I would support that wholeheartedly. Representative McDonald. Great, that was a great answer. Thank you, Representative Listergaard. And then lastly, uh, on your right side behind there's a broom, is that to clean up the mess in St. Well, to be oh, honest, with Representative you, Les Lagarde, tell us thank, about the broom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, actually, uh, there's a story there that um, my grandfather helped build Erie Mining Company that became LTV, where me and my family all worked. And when a plant is first commissioned, the first train that leaves has a tree on it. And um, when a plant is decommissioned, the very last car has a broom on it. So that is the broom to the very last car of the facility that my grandfather helped build. All my family worked there and I worked there. Representative Leslie thank you for sharing that. And you know, one of the great benefits of this virtual is you can see backgrounds and you know, hear stories like that but also, you know, having all the students to be able to participate today wouldn't have probably been possible uh, without Zoom. So, I mean, some of the, that's why when we go back to in-person, we've got to keep the Zoom capability. Representative McDonald. Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I would agree with you. Certainly, I, I think there's some merits to it. Uh, and when you go back to normal, um, we should uh, keep, adopt this and keep it for, uh, folks in Minnesota. So thank you, Representative Listergaard. That's a great story. I knew it was significant uh, and uh, precious for your family. And someday I'd like to come up to uh, visit you up north and uh, tour that area. It's great history. Thank you, Representative McDonald. And, um, and you know, I, I appreciate what you just said. I, I don't think we do enough of that, probably, uh, visiting other members' districts. And I, I, I think what you just said there is great and would be very helpful. Uh, members, anything else uh, on House File 4042 as amended? If not, uh, Representative Leslegard, final thoughts. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, it's a great day for me. I got to talk about taxes, helping schools, and talk about the history of the Iron Range, which we are all very passionate about. Um, I ask for your support here. I think the legislature in 2014 made the right decision. Um, we are investing in the future um, in, with these school projects and providing an opportunity for our students. So I would ask for your support and every, anybody is welcome to come up to the Iron Range and I will personally give you uh, a tour. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Leslie Gard. With that, the chair will lay over House File 4042 as amended. Uh, members, I'm going to call on Chair Joaquin in just a second to give us an update on kind of the schedule for the property tax division report. Uh, but next week, uh, we will have a busy week in tax committee. We're going to be meeting, of course, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 
And there will be a Friday meeting from 1030 to noon. So that's something I want you to note. And I know uh, Ms. Sergbanik is gonna be sending that out too if she hasn't already, but uh, we will be meeting next Friday from 1030 to noon. And I, with the, and so we're getting kind of, you know, we're, we're looking to have uh, the tax bill uh, out by our break. And, but I'll have uh, Cherry Joaquin talk about the schedule right now on the division report because it's certainly part of taxes and there are a number of members on the property tax division. Cherry Joaquin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so very, uh, very rapid pace in the property tax division. This last, yesterday, we just had our last hearing for bills. Um, we are putting together a division report as we speak that will be posted no later than noon on Sunday. Monday at one o'clock, we will be meeting to walk through the division report and take testimony. And Wednesday during our regular committee time, we will be um, talking about the bill, answering questions and taking any amendments and then moving it out to you. Thank you, Chair Joachim. And then what we're looking at right now for the, the tax bill then <clears throat> is to have it released and go over in committee <clears throat> well, it'd be released before this, but to look at it in committee and go over, it would be Tuesday, April 5th, and then testimony April 6th, and then um, the markup uh, on April 7th. So that's kind of the tentative schedule right now. So, so members, thanks so much. It was a busy week. Thanks so much as always for your due diligence and, and work on this committee and with that have a wonderful rest of the day and a wonderful weekend members we are adjourned mm -hmm.